As Christians, we should read the Bible every day. But it's difficult or frustrating for you. You're not alone. Tonight, we'll give you some tips on how to wield your two-edged sword of the Spirit. So please stay with us. Thank you. Thank you and welcome. I'm Father Mitch Paco and welcome to EWTN Live, our chance to bring you guests from all over the world. And tonight's guests are no strangers to EWTN viewers. They're a pair of Bible scholars who have teamed up to write a new book designed to help you get more out of the scriptures every time you read them, which for most people is not enough. Now, they're co-authors of the book, Walking with God, A Journey Through the Bible. So please welcome Dr. Tim Gray and Jeff Cavins. Tim. Hey, thank you, Father. Jeff. Good to see you, Father. It is great to have both of you back on the show. It's wonderful to be back. It's good, good, to be with you. good, good, good. And, you know, I want to congratulate you that the Bible study that you've been doing is called the Bible Timeline, correct? The Great Adventure Bible Studies, and the Bible Timeline is the kind of the basis of it, right? Okay. So this has been very successful because every, everywhere I travel, people are using it and they tell me how much they're learning from it. So this is a great thing. Why did you write this new book? You already have success. <laughs> what are you doing? Well, Tim was really the one that came up with the idea of why don't we put this in a, in a book form. There's a lot of people that uh, have gone through the Bible timeline, a lot of people who have studied with us that would really like to have it in, in a book form, something okay. they could carry around with them. And I think a lot of people who go through the seminar that Jeff and I do on the Bible timeline, the one day walk through the whole Bible, know that there's so much information, they want to be able to digest it at, a, at their own pace. And the Bible studies give them a chance to do that. But what the book does is it supplements that, and it's also a standalone. It's also a way to evangelize. I know so many people who have given this book to their Catholic friends who maybe have fallen away or to their children who have kind of been estranged from the church. And they say, here's a book that gets you into the Bible, because if we can get people into the Word of God, we get them into God, in an engagement with God. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, that's one of the things that seems to be a common experience, is going through the, the, your, your program. A lot of people find their way back to the church. What are some of the stories that you all hear? Well, we, one of the things we are hearing when people exit the church and they leave, they, they oftentimes will say, well, we left because we weren't being fed. And what they typically mean by that is that they weren't being challenged or they didn't know the Bible, they didn't know their faith, and then they, they left and they got all excited about the Lord and the church that they were going to. Um, but they end up coming back due to the scripture study and the depth of the, of the church. And so one of the things that we're doing is we're explaining the scriptures to them in light of the sacraments and the great sacred tradition of the church. It's kind of like um, in Luke chapter 24, the Emmaus Road. Uh, the two individuals are walking away from Jerusalem, and then Jesus tells all about himself from the Old Testament. He explains the entire story. Their hearts burn within them, and then we find that they're actually returning to Jerusalem. And that's what we're seeing with people that have left the Catholic Church is that once we explain this incredible family story, they end up coming back. And not only do they come back, but their marriages improve. They start praying with their children. They read the Bible with their children. They frequent the sacraments. And they are, for the first time, they're saying, my faith really means, I really understand this now. Yeah, I think Jeff is right to talk about the road to Emmaus because you see two parts. There's the day walk on, from Jerusalem to Emmaus where Jesus is opening up the scriptures. But then when they get there, they, they get to the table and Jesus breaks open the bread. And what you see there is the two parts of the, of the liturgy. You have the liturgy of the Word and then the liturgy of the Eucharist. And I think a lot of Catholics appreciate or know that we've got the, this Eucharist that's the center of our life. 
but they don't fully understand the meaning of the liturgy of the Mass and of the Eucharist because they haven't had that liturgy of the Word broken open for them. Mm -hmm. And what we find, is, as Jeff is saying, is Catholics come to know Scripture. It doesn't lead them to become less Catholic. It actually draws them into a deeper understanding of the liturgy and of the Mass and of their Catholic faith. And, and it actually makes them more Catholic. Yeah. You know, one of the things that uh, I've noticed, I mean, I've been studying Scripture a few years myself, and one of the things that I, I've also had to do is get engaged in explaining the Catholic faith to people who either have left the church or who are not Catholic but are interested in the church. And I find that Catholic theology is capable of incorporating the whole of Scripture, including the books that are disputed, the seven books that are in the Catholic Bible but not in the other Bibles, that we can include all that and that the whole Word of God is, part, is our theology. And that's one of the things that I would expect people to come back to the faith as they see the fullness of Catholicism in Scripture. I think that's one of the bracing things about the Word of God is that we have 73 books. When you have the full Catholic Bible, you have these 73 books, but they don't tell 73 separate stories. They tell one unified story. And that's really what Vatican II and the Catechism talk about, the content and unity of the Scriptures and of our faith. And as you walk through that story, and that's one of, the, I think, the powerful effects that we're seeing when people pick up Walking with God, is that they start to see that the Bible is one, uni one unified story that has an overarching plot. And as they see that plot, they see that there's a plot for the world and for their own lives. And that's what's so gripping. And that's why in Luke 24, verse 32, they say, did not our hearts burn within us as he opened to us the scriptures? Mm -hmm. the, the problem, Father, that a lot of people experience is that they, they come to the Bible and they get all excited and they want to read the Bible. And there's something, they look at it and they, there's something about it where they say, you know, this is the inspired word of God. I want to read it. And the problem that they face is they approach the Bible like a book like it's Gone with the Wind or some other book, and they start on page one, and then they go to the end, and you would expect that they would put it down and say, wow, what a great story. But they're, they don't get the story that way. In fact, they, they start and they read Genesis, and then they read Exodus, and then they hit Leviticus, and they typically will stop because they don't know what's going on anymore. And in short, they lost the narrative thread. They lost the story, and, and they, they gave up. And so yeah, for those who haven't read the Bible yet, Leviticus has a lot of rules and regulations for how to run the temple and how to do the sacrifices. Exactly. And for us, uh, we, we don't find that so interesting because we no longer go to the temple to offer animal sacrifices. So people get lost in that and it's difficult. Right. Well, what we explained to, to people is that the Bible is put together by types of literature. So you have some wisdom literature together and poetry and the prophets, and it's, it's all put together that way. But what we are trying to do is help people read through it. As, as uh, Dr. Gray said, you, mm -hmm. there's a story there, and we're trying to help them identify that, or as the Catechism says, that plan of sheer goodness that God has. You know, I think one of the things that Jeff did originally that in his teaching was he took this, the Bible and broke it into 12 periods. And he gave is people... Is that the Bible timeline? That's yeah. the Bible timeline. Okay. And I think, what, I think the genius that Jeff had there is he, he gave people 14 books of the Bible to start with. And those 14 books that Jeff chose tell the narrative story. And I remember telling Jeff that I was reading Hugh of St. Victor and his manual for priests, for training seminarians, on how to treat, teach seminarians the scriptures that are so vast and overwhelming. And he said, start with the books that tell the history. In other words, the books that tell the story. And then you see how the other books fit in, like Leviticus as right. a cultic handbook. Where does that fit into the larger story? But right. if you read it, expecting it to extend the story, the narrative of Israel, you get lost and you lose the story. And then all of a sudden it becomes meaningless. And really what we're trying to do is create a Bible study program as well as the book to teach the Bible in a way that contextualizes it so people don't lose the meaning. And then it's meaningful for them, and then it's meaningful for their own lives. You know, there's certainly a problem with reading the prophets, for instance, because the prophets are not in chronological exactly. order. They're, right. in, they're, they're in order of size, and uh, some chronology vaguely, but not much. And they're not, in, they're not put in the Bible in the chronological order in which they happen, but they were... They belong in the period of the kings and, and, and chronicles. Exactly. As you know, Father, you know, a copy of the Bible in Jesus' day 
if you went down to your local Barnes and Noble and said, give me a copy of the Bible, they'd say, okay, come back in nine months, we'll get a, a bunch of scribes working on it, it'll be $100,000. Right. I mean, people didn't have their own Bibles, and so the, the order of the Bible, the order of the canon, wasn't for individual reading. As you said, it was collecting different genres, you know, prophets according to size and different things, and putting them in, in the c- groups of collections. It wasn't taking the Bible, and it w- never argued that or intended to be a chronological telling of Israel's story. No. That's what the liturgy was to present the story of Israel through the liturgical readings that would be s- taking different selections of the canon. Once we have the printing press, all of a sudden that canon gets published, and now people have this Bible in a, in a particular order, so they, they pick up their Bible. That Bible has all these books in this order, but it's not chronological, and we expect as Americans in the modern world, when we pick up a book, it's going to be in chronological order. So you get Ezra and Nehemiah way before you'd expect them, and so people get lost. And so what we're trying to do is tell people how to read the right order of the books so they don't lose that narrative story. Right. It's kind of giving people keys, uh, keys to this, what's been a mystery to them. And the response that we get is really incredible. I'm people crying, literally, and saying, I've always wanted to know how to read the Bible, but they didn't, they didn't know how. The other thing that we've noticed, Father, is that once people understand the story of salvation history, they start to really understand their own life and where, where they fit in. And today in television, on the Internet, and mobile communicating, there's so, so many shows and so many uh, opportunities for people to get answers to the problems that they have in life. They're watching television, looking on the Internet, and all yeah, there are a number of these self-help programs yeah. and conversation programs where they bring in self-help people, and mm-hmm. they're looking for all sorts of things. They're looking for answers in life, and all this time, God is saying, I want a relationship with you. Um, I want, as a, a Verbum uh, Domini says, I want a conversation. Verbum Domini, what's that? That is a new document that uh, Pope Benedict just put out that explains really the place of the Bible in the life of the church, and it's a, it's a phenomenal, uh, phenomenal document. Uh, and it talks about a conversation. God wants to have a conversation. And metaphors like a, a love letter or um, a father speaking to his children have been used down through the years uh, concerning the Bible and its relationship to people. And this is what people are hungering for. But what is really fascinating is that once people start to understand the Bible, they start to understand their whole life as a Catholic. For example, everything Catholic really can be fit into the catechism. You have the creed as one pillar. You have sacraments and liturgy as a second pillar. Life in Christ as the third. And then you have prayer. Well, the creed comes first for a reason. Uh, It is the story or the plan kind of in in miniature. And the sacraments and life in Christ and prayer all spring from this incredible story, this plan of salvation history. And so a lot of people that they'll approach, for example, the sacraments, if they do that and they don't know the story of salvation history, it can seem dry at times. There's not a backdrop for them to understand it. So once they understand this incredible story, it's amazing how much of their faith starts falling into place. Mm-hmm. In um, one of the things that, uh, as as you speak, um, I was I was thinking how a lot of times people will say, "Why are you trying to encourage Catholics to read the Bible? I thought Catholics were not allowed to read the Bible." What do you say to that? <laughs> Well, I have never been told not to read the Bible myself. That's one thing I tell them, because people have come up to me and said, well, when I was a kid, I was told, you know, I wasn't supposed to be uh, reading the Bible. Uh, the church tells us, tells the faithful to read the scriptures. The catechism tells us to, uh, to read the scriptures. And uh, both Pope John Paul II and Pope Benedict XVI have both encouraged the faithful to... Pope Leo XIII, mm-hmm. you know, with, with, in, in his book on the Holy Spirit. Right, sure. I'll be back, yeah. All the way back to 1893. Right. Where, uh, the, you know, I think the, one of the big things when people tell me that, it's usually older people who talk about when they were in school or whatever else that they, the Bible was discouraged. And I think Vatican II and its Constitution on Divine Revelation really exhorted it. And in fact, it, it directly said the Council exhorts all the lay faithful to read daily and assiduously the Bible. And we just had a synod on Scripture that Pope Benedict called a few years ago. 
that called again for Catholics to know and love Scripture. And that's really the Pope's letter that Jeff mentioned, Verbum Domini, was an exhortation again for the Scripture to become central to Catholic life. So whatever was done in practice in the 50s or 40s, you know, right now the church has been clear and it's becoming stronger in her voice saying we have to be people who know and love the Word of God. In fact, Pope Benedict says in his letter on Scripture that familiarity with God depends on a growing familiarity with the Word of God. We've got to listen to God speak. If we love God, we're going to listen to these love letters, as Jeff said. We're going to open these love letters and read them. As a matter of fact, when I was a little boy in Catholic grammar school in the 1950s, we all had Bibles. You know, the, the nun kept them in a cabinet so it wouldn't spill our milk on them. <laughs> but, you know, when it was time to do Bible study, Bibles were distributed to everybody, and then we could read the Bible. Yeah. I don't wonder if, if in America there were certain Catholics who were afraid of Scripture because of being a Catholic minority in a dominantly Protestant majority. And I think the Reformation created a, a split where you had people of the book and you had people of the liturgy, and, but the Catholics never lost the sense of Scripture being central to the faith. And you see that in the Catechism of the Council of Trent and other things. But maybe in practice at times, Catholics drifted away from Scripture. But that's certainly not the case now. The church is calling. And I think as, as we Catholics become more biblically literate and love the Scriptures, we're going to see many Protestants, brothers and sisters, coming back to the church because they're going to see that you can love the Word of God and be Catholic. As a matter of fact... One of the things that Pope Leo XIII did was require every Catholic Bible to have printed in the beginning of it an indulgence for reading Scripture wow. so that you, you, Catholic, you know, you, if you wanted Catholics to do something, give them an <laughs> indulgence. So, so there was an indulgence for reading Scripture. And if you read it in a group, you got a plenary indulgence. I think you read, read Scripture for a half hour as a group. You got a plenary indulgence. So they were trying to encourage the average lay Catholic to read the Bible and get Bibles into Catholic homes. I agree. Oh, well, good. That's what we're trying to do. One of the funny things, do. though, is occasionally I'll quote Scripture, chapter and verse, and people say, when did you convert? <laughs> you know, or or when, when are, you, are, are you a revert? And I'm a cradle Catholic, but I, the idea is I want to show that Catholics can know and love Scripture. Mm -hmm. and exactly. I'm, and I'm a cradle Catholic, too. And I, was, I grew up Catholic, and the first time that I had a desire to read the Bible was the night of my confirmation. Um, I received from my sponsor a St. Joseph Bible, and I came home. I sat it on my end table. I looked at it, and I had this desire to read it. And I came up with this marvelous plan at you know, just a young age. I'll read one verse a night for the rest of my life, and by the time I'm old, say 40 or so, <laughs> I will have read the whole Bible. Well, that lasted about a couple of weeks. And part of the reason is, is because I didn't have a plan to read it. I didn't have a, a path to read it. Nobody showed me how to read it. And I think that, you know, when people have, you we were mentioning earlier, people saying, well, I was told not to read it. Maybe some people are afraid to read it. Maybe they think they're going to do damage to it or they're going to misinterpret it. And I think that's why the Vatican uh, or... Um, uh, the Catechism of the Catholic Church in paragraphs 112 through 117 gives some very simple guidelines for studying the Bible. And once people know that, you know, hey, there, there's some guidelines to this and there is a Catholic way to study the Bible, it kind of sets them free to jump in and, and uh, explore and start to listen to God and talk to God. But see, that's one of the things that you've done, though, is you've also given a tool for a Catholic way of studying the Bible. And that's a great gift, you know, that, that you've made available to a lot of people, and a lot more people are learning more about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're both using that, that tool. Uh, Tim is using that at the Augustine Institute in, uh, in Denver, Colorado. And, uh, Which is what? What's the Augustine Institute? The Augustine Institute uh, is a grad Catholic graduate school that's focused on evangelization and Scripture. That always surprises some people. The Catholic school focused on evangelization and Scripture, but that's what we are in uh, Denver, Colorado. So we have a, a distance education program as well as an on-campus program to really train people in catechesis, youth ministry, scripture, evangelization, and uh, trying to be part of an agent of this new evangelization that's, okay. that the church is calling for. And, I'm not and you're doing, uh, uh, you don't have your own institute as such, but you're also getting out there the, the, the Bible timeline and the study guides and all. How are you doing it? 
Well, we are out there doing uh, seminars on, on the weekend, going through the entire Bible on a Saturday, helping laity to go through the entire scripture. But I'm also the director of uh, the Archbishop Harry J. Flynn Catechetical Institute for the Archdiocese of St. Paul in Minneapolis. And in there, too, to teach uh, catechetics, a knowledge of Scripture is very, very important as a foundation. And so we're using that, that timeline for not only graduate studies, but catechetical formation at the archdiocesan level. Okay. Okay, good. Good. Sounds like, like good stuff. And that the response from from the people is a very positive response uh, that, they're, that they're learning a lot, you know, from it. I'll, t- I'll tell you, can I, just let me interject sure. this because it's, it's really a good analogy. You know how excited people are getting? I remember, I've been married 32 years. <laughs> 30, going on 33 years. I'm going on 33 years. I remember when Emily wrote me a love letter before we got married. You talk about exciting. You talk about looking into my eyes and seeing there's a guy who's been, you know... Smitten. Oh, wow. That's what people are doing. When they finally learn how to read the Bible, they're smitten. They're in love. And it, they just become new people. Right, right. That's absolutely true. You know, we try to give the practical tools for people to read the Bible and where to start. And, and we kind of give context, historical context, literary context to the different stories and books of the Bible. But what people discover is, as they discover the Bible story, as Jeff said earlier, they're discovering their own story. Because the plot of Scripture is the plot for the world and for each human person. You know, we're all called to live the story of Christ. How do you, how do you mean that it's the plot for each person? I mean, yeah. there are a lot of things in the Bible I hope I never would have to do, like sacrifice a son or something like that. I don't have that's a son, right. so that's, that's going to keep me out, won't it? <laughs> so how can that be my life? You know, because... Right from the beginning, the, the challenge for Adam and Eve is do they trust God? Can they trust God? And that's really what's at the heart of the challenge for all of us. And so even if you take the, the fall, and at what's at the heart of the fall isn't simply that there's, they're tempted towards something good. They're tempted to say, why would God hold something good back from us? And now they begin to doubt God's goodness. And that's exactly what we struggle with. I mean, people usually don't have a, a, a faith crisis because they don't think God's smart enough. What they wonder, does God really care about me? Does, God, does God's love, this creator who made this great cosmos, does he love and care about me in the midst of my faults, problems, sins, and in the midst of this big world? And that's what scripture tells us. It tells us that we're made in the image and likeness of God. And it's a struggle for how do we, like Abraham, trust, no matter what the circumstances are, even if it's the loss of a child, how do I trust in God's goodness and God's plan of sure goodness that the catechism uses to describe the Bible and salvation history, this plan of sure goodness. And so all these different stories, we can relate with the reality of Abraham or Jacob. These are real characters who are wrestling with God, which is the very name for Israel. And so we're like Israel. We wrestle with God. The word Israel means to wrestle with God. Right. And, And that's what's so striking. What I love is that as you enter into the story, you realize Jacob's a real person. He's he says to God, if you bring me back here safely, then you'll be my God. I mean, you don't have flat characters who are just simply, you know, holy and simply good all the way through. You have real human beings who are falling, struggling, doubting, mm-hmm. and wrestling with God. And I love that God is the kind of father who names Jacob, which then becomes the father of his people, Israel. He names him Israel because that means to wrestle with God. Very different from a religion like Islam, which means to surrender to submit. God God doesn't want slaves. God wants sons and daughters who will wrestle with him in free love. Mm -hmm. And that's what's so exciting. That's why, as Jeff said, it's a love letter. And it's an invitation. You know, the story of salvation history is an invitation to intimacy. It's an invitation to, to walk with God. That's why we call the book Walking with God, because ultimately we're called to walk with him. As Adam and Eve walked in the garden, we're called to walk with God in this new covenant. And you know, in Jesus' day, uh, young boys would grow up and they were taught. They were taught uh, to learn the Torah. They were taught to learn the prophets. But then their father also taught them a trade. And then there came a point where a rabbi would say to the young man, either come follow me, which meant take my yoke upon you. I think you can become like me. You have what it takes to become like me. Or the rabbi would say to that young man, go ply your trade. In other words, do what your father taught you to do. And that tells us something about the apostles. They were out fishing. In other words, 
maybe they didn't make the cut. They were out doing their father's trade. Their father's trade. And here Jesus, the greatest rabbi of all time, the King of mm -hmm. Kings and the Lord of Lords says, come follow me. In other words, I think you can become like me. And ultimately that's where the story is taking, is taking us, is that we're all called to be what the, what the catechism says, divinized. We're called to become like God. We're called to be with God and to live our lives in, in Christ. And so every person that picks up the Bible has that call from Christ you can become like me. I'm not going to reject you. You don't have to go and look for another story. You come follow me. And that's what we're hearing from people as they're saying, I'm following them. Pope Benedict recently quoted St. Ambrose who said that if we pick up the Bible with faith, we can walk with God once again in the garden. And, uh, you know, that's a beautiful quote that really illustrates this invitation that Jeff is talking about, that we're invited to have a relationship with God, but you can't have a relationship with somebody that you don't communicate with. And that's the beauty of the Bible, is it's, it's God speaking to us, and we can enter into that dialogue. And sometimes that dialogue, like the psalmist, who does a lament psalm, is a wrestling with God, and sometimes it's a romance. It, it, and that's the beautiful thing about the Bible, is it has it all. It has all of human emotion. It has all of human life. It has the whole thing. And, and we, as we enter into that word, we can really encounter God in our daily lives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I'm also aware of is that your method of presenting the, the story of salvation history is not new. St. Augustine had done the same kind of thing, had he not? Absolutely. You know, Augustine talked about the narratio in, in one of his books, on, which we catechize with Rudibus, on catechizing the ignorant, which we usually translate more politically correctly as on teaching the faith. Augustine writes out this book in answer to a deacon who writes to Augustine, and this deacon says, how do I teach the faith? People, people are falling asleep in class. There's so much material to cover. I don't know where to start. I don't know where to end. And so Augustine has to answer that question. How do, I, how do you teach the faith? And Augustine says, tell the story. Begin with, in the beginning, God created. So Genesis 1.1. And he says, go all the way through the story of salvation history to present day church history. And, you know, that's a key method we, we emphasize in our teaching at the Augustine Institute. But that's really the backbone of what Jeff and I are doing with the Great Adventure Bible Study and the book, is we're trying to tell the story. Jesus was a great storyteller because he was the great teacher. And he knew that if you could catch people with a story, you could catch their, capture their imagination, their minds, and therefore their hearts. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the story is key. I, th I think, Father, what makes walking with God different than just, it's, it's not just a look at Bible history, but it's the telling of a dynamic relationship between God and man, accenting all of the weaknesses of man, uh, the problems that we face, and how God condescends and comes down to our life here and helps us with the addictions to sin, with the doubts and with the the, the angst that we feel in our heart. He is he's calling us and wooing us to a, to a greater life. And ultimately, Father, that's what we feel that this is all about, is it's all about inviting to a relationship, inviting people to a relationship. And so there's really a modest goal, and that is people, here's God. God, here's your hurting people. We want, to, we want people to come in contact with that tremendous plan. Mm -hmm. I want to give some information about you know, this so that people can find out more about it. Uh, the Great Adventure Bible Study and Bible Timeline can be reached by going to www.biblestudyforcatholics. Make that one word, Bible Study for Catholics. Dot com, And you can find out more about this great adventure and the t Bible timeline and get involved in learning more about your Bible. We want Bible literate Catholics who fall in love with God and fall in love with the sacred scriptures. We're going to take a break. We want to come back and get your questions as well as questions and comments from our studio audience. So please stay with us.
Welcome back. Uh, we have a really nice big audience here tonight. Uh, three big pilgrimage groups and a number of individuals from different places of the country. And we'd love to have you come and join us. It, whether you come as a big in, uh, pilgrim group, whether you come as a family or a parish group or as an individual, you're more than welcome to be part of our studio audience. So please contact our pilgrimage department at 205 271 2966. That's 205 271 2966. Or go to the website www.ewtn.com and we'll try to get you to come and join us. So, uh, as a matter of fact, what they'll also do is give you information on the masses and the uh, tours of the studios and a variety of other things where you can stay. And so, so please contact them and they'll be glad to help you. You ready for some questions? Sure. All right, let's go to a call. We have Marianne on the line. Hello, Marianne. Hi, Father Paco. How are you? Fine. Where are you from? I'm calling from a very rainy New York. How are you? Uh, I'm in a very beautiful springtime day in uh, Alabama. <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad spring has found Alabama because it certainly has not found New York yet. It'll be cut. We'll send you some. Uh, thank you. Uh, my question is for you and your guests. Um, I've always enjoyed and loved reading my Bible, and I get great comfort from reading the Gospels and the New Testament. However, I've always found the Old Testament um, a little disconcerting, with the exception of Proverbs, in its sometimes harshness and many times brutality. And I was hoping to get some suggestions from your guests and yourself uh, how to find comfort and hope uh, in Old Testament readings. Sure. And thank you very much. That's a great question. You know, a lot of times people are, can be, feel like the Old Testament is something they don't want to approach because it has a lot of violence and it has a lot of uh, things that you'd find on cable TV, quite frankly. Uh, yeah, and, it's, it's, and, it's definitely uh, PG rated. Yes, exactly. And, and, and here's the thing I'd say. Our, our life is full of violence. I mean, look what's going on right now in the world. You know, the, our, the world and life and history and reality is full of violence. It's full of parental guidance materials. And so what, the, what the, the beautiful thing about the Bible is that God's not afraid to enter into the life of his people in the midst of the world and all their messiness and all the ugliness and all the lust and all the greed and all the power and all the violence. And yet God's working in the midst of all that to bring Israel to himself. And I think when you, when you read the Psalms, when you read, uh, as, as you read the story, and one of the things we try to do in the beginning of the book uh, with walking with God is to show people that the God of the Old Testament is the same God of the New Testament who dies on the cross, that he's a God of love and mercy, patience and compassion, but entered into that very ugly, very intense story of Israel. And, uh, and you know, we could spend the next hour going into examples right. of that. But one example I like to give is that, you know, one year for Christmas, my son gave me a uh, pirate hat and a hook. I was a Cap Captain Hook hat, and he was Peter Pan. So we went out in the backyard immediately and, pr and played. And so if someone would have walked out there and saw this adult man walking with a pirate hat, trying to put on a pirate brogue, and with a plastic hook and a plastic sword in his hand, they would have said, this guy's not playing with a full deck. He's, he's a nut, right? right? But then all of a sudden, if they see that, they, they look a little bit wider context, and they see a boy who's playing with his father, all of a sudden, what looked like a madman, what looked like a, a crazy adult, is a loving father playing and coming down to the level of his son. And that's what we want to show who God is in the Old Testament. I think, too, St. Irenaeus has a very important recapitulation of theology mm -hmm. whereby he sees Israel going through stages of development. And there's a maturing process in that history of Israel. They, while they're rougher in the earlier centuries, they become more refined and, and like you said in Proverbs, that's a very refined level of, of Israel's history. And so that the refinement develops through the New Testament. And that's another important thing to notice, that there's growth and development. There, there really is. And even, in, even from the beginning of Genesis to Exodus, you see God as a God of mercy, too, right. trying to teach and develop Israel along the way. Right. Let's go to a question from our studio audience. Sir, where are you from? I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Great. And what's your question? Well, my question, Father, is what you asked um, about the sword of the Spirit in the book of Ephesians 6.10. Right. And how do you use the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God? And my second question is, Father, um, 
the, the, the same uh, chapter is, um, how do you use a shield of faith to extinguish all the fire darts most wicked one? Because I get shot arrows a lot from, you know, from the devil and stuff, but see, when, it, when the arrow comes, it goes right through my shield. Okay, so, so St. Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 6 that we put on the armor of God, and the one weapon that we are allowed is the two-edged sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Right. How does he use that? Yeah, the, the sword is the only offensive weapon. In fact, even in the book of Revelation, in Revelation 19, when Christ comes on the white horse, he has the sword that comes out of his mouth, a two-edged sword. So the sword is, in the Christian imagination, the Christian thinking, it's the one offensive weapon, but the sword is always the sword of the Word of God. So in other words, it's the Word of God that is our offensive weaponry. And a good example of that is what we start with every season in Lent. Jesus in the wilderness, tested by the devil, and what, is, what does Jesus use in his battle with the devil? He quotes the Word of God, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 8, 8, 3. 3. Right. So that's our sword. If we meditate on God's word, we know God and God's love clings to us. And it's, it's the weapon against the devil. It's the weapon against the temptations to sin. As a matter of fact, I don't know if you've noticed, but the, the, the other two quotes, of course, you notice that one is uh, uh, Exodus 6.13 and, uh, and Exodus uh, 6, um, I forget the other verse, which, but it's in chapter 6. Mm-hmm. And all three quotes are from Deuteronomy. Right. From the Mount of Temptation, you can see the plains of Moab where Moses gave the book of Deuteronomy. So he's got the sight of the place of the giving of the book of Deuteronomy in, in his eyesight as he, yeah. as he gives it. Exactly. Go ahead, John. Well, it brings out another important point, and the Catechism brings this out, this recapitulative history where Jesus is fulfilling all righteousness. And in the example you're giving, in Matthew chapter 3, Jesus comes up out of the waters of baptism, and then he goes into the wilderness, and he's, he's tempted three times. He uses the sword of the Spirit, and he is successful. And that is a pattern of, of Israel coming up out of the Red Sea, going into the wilderness for 40 years, and they were tried, but they failed. And Moses reprimands the older generation and he encourages the younger generation in Deuteronomy 6 and 8, and that's right where Jesus quotes from. Exactly. In Deuteronomy exactly. 6 and 8. Exactly. All right, let's go to another call. We have Mary on the line. Hello, Mary. Hi, Father. Hi, where are you from? Pennsylvania. Great, and what's your question? My question is, Father, um, thanks for having your show, and uh, I'm a product of the 50s, too, and I do remember us learning our Bible history and reading the Scriptures, but we also had got a basic knowledge of our catechism, the old-time Baltimore catechism, with the children don't seem to be getting that today. Do you and your speakers think that we could study the Bible and our catechism at the same time? I'm going to hang up and listen to your reply. Thanks Thank for your show, Father. Thank Bye-bye. you for calling in. Well, you know, Cardinal Schoenborn, who edited the catechism, said that the catechism is, in a sense, a commentary on sacred scripture. So they're not, you know, the catechism, in a sense, is distilling the church's faith, but it's largely a reflection of her faith that's a reflection of the Word of God, how, what God speaks to us, what God commands us to do. So the catechism and scripture are closely joined together. And I think one of, the, one of the things that Jeff and I try to do throughout all the Great Adventure Bible studies is as you're studying scripture, we give you lots of quotes from the catechism. We're constantly going back and forth between scripture and the catechism. The two need to be read together and the two need to be taught. That's foundational, no doubt about it. We always put a big emphasis on studying the catechism with the Bible. Those four pillars, you have the creed, which is the plan, salvation, history, scripture. Then the second pillar is the sacraments and liturgy, and that's in how you get into this plan. And then the third is the life, life in Christ, and that's your script in a way. That's what you live. You live out the life of Christ, and then you have prayer. So all four pillars are so important to understanding uh, this entire plan that God has, and the scriptures act as a, as a foundation. So uh, we don't teach the Bible without the catechism, really. Okay, good, good. Sir, uh, where are you from? Pittsburgh, PA. And what is your question? Um, I find that the most difficult book to read is the book of Revelations because of the interpretations given to several different aspects of it. Does your book uh, outline a path by which we could follow to 
read that book? It's a great question. You know, I think we don't tackle Revelation per se in our book, but we do have a whole Bible study in The Great Adventure on uh, the book of Revelation. So it's, it's an entire study on the book of Revelation that breaks down all the symbolism all, and, and basically how to read it. And I think one of the things that happens, most people try to read the book of Revelation in isolation to the rest of the Bible. They try to have, in a sense, the book of Revelation in one hand and then watch the, you know, what, the breaking cable news on the other hand and try to interpret the, the book of Revelation through that means. And it doesn't work that way. You, to understand the book of Revelation, all of its symbolism is rooted in the earlier books of the Bible, in the earlier scriptural stories. So if you want to know what 666 means, you've got to know what's going on in 1 Kings chapter 10, for example. If you want to know who the four horsemen are, you've got to know the book of uh, Zechariah. You know, and so, or, you know, or one like a son of man coming on the clouds. You've got to know the book of Daniel. So all, every image in the book of Revelation comes from one of the earlier books of the Bible. And so one of the things we think is that if you, if you get the story, if you go through a book like Walking with God, you're, prep, you're better prepared knowing Israel and Jesus' story to read the story of Revelation, but then we have a whole Bible study on that. Okay, good, good. I have another question from our studio audience. Sir, where are you from? Birmingham, Alabama, Father. Good to have you here. And what's your question? Uh, first off, I want to congratulate Jeff for becoming a grandfather. Thank you. Oh, are you a grandpa? Uh, a month ago. Congratulations. I'm a grandfather. Thank you. I have a little, uh, a little boy, Dominic. Uh, I, I don't know a whole lot about these things, but as an uncle, I would tell you that it's a lot easier than being a parent. And it's a parent. <laughs> yeah. when, they it's, get, when they leak, you can give them back. <laughs> That's right. And it's so much fun, you know. And uh, I'm finding that I'm loving my daughter all over again as I watch her love mm. this child. It's an amazing thing. Oh, really. Thank great. you. I appreciate it. And also, I'm one of your students. Uh, I got a group of 20 here that are taking the uh, Bible timeline right now. So we're here. And this is a Bible question for all three of you. Uh, in Acts chapter 2, uh, during Pentecost, we are told that the apostles and the Blessed Virgin Mary are gathered in the upper room. But in the Bible, it says that they're gathered in one place. And I'm wondering, how big is the upper room if, it's, uh, if 120 people can gather there? And also, Father Mitch, uh, since Tim and Jeff have done Bible studies, we're, I'm wondering, are you ever going to do a Bible study for EWTN? I've already oh. done some. <laughs> I've done lots of them, in fact. Oh. I've done about 450 episodes of Bible study. But those are sermons, Father. <laughs> no, 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 Bible study. You know, oh, okay. Yeah. You, know, you know what's interesting about the, the Bible, you doing Bible study is that before I came back to the Catholic Church, I sat every day and learned from you as you did Bible studies here at EWTN. Yeah, that's so, right. That's Rabbi. Rabbi. Right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, do you want to tackle that? Yeah, you know, in Acts chapter 2, it says that all the disciples were gathered, and there's 120 in one place. But it doesn't say what the place is. We oftentimes assume that it's the upper room. But I would interpret that as the temple, because what we also know is you read through the next few chapters of Acts, the Christians are constantly gathering in the temple for prayer. So they go to the temple for prayer. They always go to their homes to break bread for the Eucharist because they separate from the temple sacrifice. But they go to the temple as a, a place of prayer. And then the Holy Spirit shakes the house and the place that they're at. And then immediately Peter and the disciples speak in tongues and many hear them. In fact, 3,000 people are baptized by Peter and the early disciples. And I think, and you know, Father, because you go to the Holy Land like I do all the time, that as you go to the southern steps of the, of the Temple Mount, there's a whole bunch of mikvahot, these right. ritual bathing places where pilgrims had to go through a, a full immersion ritual bath before they would enter the temple. So where does Peter baptize 3,000 new converts on Pentecost Day? Well, I think they're gathered in the temple. That's the house that shakes. The Holy Spirit comes upon them in the temple. Peter preaches. Many of the crowds who are also gathered for prayer on that feast hear them. They convert. They go down to the mikvahot, and that's where the church is baptized and born, so to speak, on Pentecost. It's possible. <laughs> <laughs> From one scripture scholar to another. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> the, the upper room is in the Essene neighborhood. Right. And one of the things about, I, I like the upper room, which is plenty big enough. You could put a couple hundred people in there easily. Um, but uh, the, even though the, the modern one is, 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 is modern, it was built by the Franciscans back in the Middle Ages. But, you know, the, the orig it's built over the original and it would be able to have a couple hundred people in there without a problem. 
But one of the things I like about the Essene neighborhood is in the sermon, it makes allusion to David's burial among us. And in that neighborhood, there had been a tomb of David. Right next door. And so they may be making allusion to that. So that's, and because it was in a scene neighborhood, there would be a lot of mikvahot over in that neighborhood too. That is true. So, so it's possible either way. Right. And so all we can do is argue about it, but, <laughs> but in the most friendly way because we don't really know. Right, that's you know, correct. You know. Let's take another call. We have Patricia on the line. Hello, Patricia. Hello, Father Pekwa. How are you? I'm great. Where are you in from? Te- Texas. Texas. Ain't you something? Well, I, I want to say, first of all, thank you so much for what you do, Father uh, Pacwa, and for having such awesome guests that you normally do and just uh, continuing just to educate us all over the country and the world. Well, my, my question pleasure. has to do with Revelation. Um, it, I, very quickly, and I, I think you've already touched on this very briefly, but I'll be, I'll, I'll be quick and hang up. The question is, many people see uh, Revelations as doom and gloom and just hopelessness, and really it has to do with the imagery as far as validation of the Catholic Church on earth. There's so much symbolism, there's mystery, but it really validates the Catholic Church and um, what, what we're doing here on earth. And I, why isn't there more discussion and more education on that? And, Okay. Well, certainly when you read the book of Revelation, it can seem like gloom and doom because you have these, uh, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven bulls, and tremendous destruction that's taking place to uh, Jerusalem. But you have to remember that the beginning of the letter is a letter to the seven churches of Asia Minor. And John, St. John is saying, I'm with you. I want to encourage you. And uh, we, we are serving the one who, is, who has overcome and St. John takes them on a journey from earth to, you know, where their problems are at. And he takes them to heaven and he shows them the heavenly liturgy and how heaven really is the center of power of the universe. And we see, for example, the lamb standing as though slain and all the angels and the saints worshiping and praising God. We even get words from our own liturgy from the heavenly liturgy going on in Jerusalem. The the message in the book of Revelation is that, is that we have overcome. Jesus has overcome. The enemy has been defeated. We overcome. And uh, I, I use the, this analogy that um, sometimes on Sunday we watch football. I go to church, but then I want to come home and I want to watch football, so I DVR it. I tape it. So I'm, I, when I get home, I'm watching a game at the beginning, but it's really almost over with. And by the time I get to the second quarter, the game is over. And I can't do anything about it. And I get all upset and I'm yelling. And the truth of the matter is, the Vikings have already won. They've already won. And I'm all uptight about all this. And that's where people are at today is, you know what? You're getting really uptight. But I got to tell you, we read the end of the book. We win. Right. We right. win. Right. We have another question from our studio audience. Ma'am, where are you from? I'm from Pensacola, Florida. Good to have you here. Welcome. And what's your question? Thank you. Well, I was trying to talk one of our priests into going a little deeper in the scriptures. And he said the people just weren't smart enough for him to do that. What would you do? You know, it reminds me of there's a great quote from St. Saint- Uh, Pope Gregory the Great, who said that Scripture is like the raging stream that is shallow enough for a lamb to cross, but deep enough at the same time for an elephant to drown. And I think that Scriptures are deep enough for an elephant. You know, Father, you've got your doctorate. I've got my doctorate in Scripture. We've studied the biblical languages. I'm just a novice in terms of learning the Word of God. Exactly. It it is so over my head and so deep and mysterious. and, And there's, you know, one could spend many lifetimes and not even scratch the depth of what this book is about. But at the same time, God is speaking a word to all of his children in this. And so we can, at a a basic rudimentary level, as Gregory says, understand the basic sense of the plot and the basic meaning. That is, this is a story of God's love. One can understand why the Father sent his Son and what Jesus' sacrifice on the cross means. Even though we can't fully comprehend it, we can look at the cross and read that story of the Passion and know God is love. And that can feed us. 
And St. Ephraim said that reading the Bible is like drinking from a fountain. He said, don't be discouraged at all the water that falls to the, to the ground, but be encouraged and thankful for what you have received. For you do not exhaust the fountain, but the fountain exhausts you. And we are all children coming to God, and he has given us a fountain that is never going to end, and that's the good news. Okay. Let's go to another call. We have David on the line. Hello, David. Yes. Hi. Where are you from? Winter Haven, Florida. Good to have you. And what's your question? My question is for uh, Jeff. Um, my wife and I facilitate the great adventure uh, at St. Joseph's Catholic Church, Winter Haven, Florida. Harem warfare, very tough thing for Christians and Catholics to understand. How, would, how can a loving God order his people as they cross the Jordan to kill every man, woman, and child an animal in Jericho. It's, it's hard for us to understand. Well, I, I appreciate the question, and, it, and it's a question that comes up over and over, and people are stumped on that. I'm going to uh, just identify or uh, give you a, a kind of an explanation of what harem warfare is, and then um, I'll let uh, Dr. Gray answer the question. <laughs> but harem warfare is where a, a city is completely obliterated. It's a holocaust unto the Lord. And Jericho was under what's called this ban, where there was such wickedness in the city that it was utterly destroyed. And that does cause problems when people read that. And they, they struggle with that. And it's a, it's a logical, logical question. And I'm sure it comes up a lot at the, at the Institute or the Augusta Institute. It does. It's a, it's a frequent question. And I, and I think one of the key things Father, and we, and we talk about this in the a section on the conquest in the book. So we give a, a, a good treatment of harem warfare and what's going on. But I would say this, that was not God's plan A. And we, we go into this more detail, but in Exodus 23, Exodus 23, verse 27, God says, I will drive out the people before you as with hornets and terror. And so the idea was originally they would be driven away by fear. But we know as Israel refuses with Joshua and the spies when they go spout the land to enter the land when they should have. And Rahab says, 40 years later, when they enter the promised land, everyone's, everyone's heart melted before, before you. We were all terrified. But it's been 40 years because Israel disobeyed God's, God's word and didn't trust him to enter the right. land because people would have fled because the, the Israelites had defeated the Egyptian army by being free and crossing the Red Sea. And so everyone in Canaan was a small, Canaan was a small power compared to Egypt. So they were afraid they would have fled. But Israel disobeyed God, and so now plan B kicks in. And I like to think about what happens in Matthew 19 as a, as a, as a lens to read this. In Matthew 19, Jesus is asked, you know, is it lawful to divorce? And Jesus says, no. And they say, well, why did Moses allow divorce in Deuteronomy? And Jesus says, be, he allowed it because of the hardness of your hearts. In other words, this is a law that's not good, that is not part of God's plan, but is allowed because of hardness of heart. It's a plan B. And what's fascinating is that there's even a critique within the Old Testament in Ezekiel 20 and 25 and Jeremiah uh, 7 of laws that God did not like, that were not good, that weren't part of God's plan, that were allowed by Moses because of Israel's hardness of heart. And so I think, I think there's, again, it, it's just an example of how understanding the history and the literary genres help you contextualize these events and incidents and commands to, to see them in their proper light. Right. And, you know, you, you see that they, they learn not to do that again. They, they, this does not become a regular pattern. It, it's something that they do at Jericho, but they don't continue to do. So this is part of that growth yeah. from uh, over the centuries. And even those who believe in Jericho, like Rahab and her family, are brought into the covenant people of God. Right. And so you see people, outsiders coming in, and then you have Achan, who's wicked, who's an Israelite, who ends up as an outsider. And so, again, God's showing no partiality, even in the beginning of the book of Joshua, which seems like, for a lot of people, just a case of ethnic genocide. And that's not what's right. going on in the narrative. Right, right. All right. Um, again, I want to remind you that you can get the Great Adventure Bible Study and, the, and, and Bible uh, at EW10's Religious Catalog. Uh, you go to EW10ReligiousCatalog.com and get that information there. Uh, and we'd be happy to s send it to you. Uh, I want to thank both of you and uh, all of our audience for being with us tonight. 
and I want to give you my blessing. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You know, we can bring you this program and great guests like this because of you. This network is brought to you by you. You make it possible with your donations to EWTN. So we ask you, as we always do, please keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill so that we can pay all of our bills and keep on bringing more programs like this to you. God bless you and thank you very much.